I studied filmmaking in the U.S. during the 70s. Recently, I've been doing talk shows on the voiceless dissidents, those that deserve to be heard but are silenced by the corporate media. The Treasury Department of the present Trump administration sanctioned me and my colleagues. You must have harassed them. You continue the show right here from my home. I am Nadir Talib Zadeh on Nadir's show. On Nadir's show. Greetings. Today I will interview Dr. Jacob Cohen, French Jewish scholar who is a member of the Zionist youth movement. These days he's revealing how Mossad manipulates the Jewish population in his country and abroad. He's a critic of the occupation of Palestine and the Zionist agenda. Dr. Jacob Cohen is a Jewish scholar and was born in 1944. He studied law and political science in Casablanca and Paris, and he's a famous writer. Dr. Cohen is the author of many novels about Morocco's society, as well as politically engaged novels about Zionist Jews in France. It should be mentioned that he joined the Zionist youth movement at the age of 16, but left when he was 20. He is well known for being an anti-Zionist activist and Palestine advocate. He had revealed to the world how Mossad manipulates Jews in his country and recruits them as undercover agents, what we actually call Sayanim. He was shockingly attacked by the Jewish Defense League in 2012, while he was launching his latest book about Palestine. Dr. Cohen maintains that through all these years of being an activist, and how he was treated by the Zionists, he came to the conclusion that this has helped him to be self-assured about the Israeli apparatus inside out. Thank you very much, Dr. Cohen. It's a privilege to be with you here in Beirut um, and talking about your work and your legacy. Um, I would like to begin with the fact that you have concentrated on uh, the Sionim, uh, the, the recruiting mm -hmm. of um, uh, Jewish Zionists in the cultures and arts uh, in the world by the Mossad. And you, you mentioned in the, the date 1948 as the beginning of that campaign which infiltrated and uh, and the people who were chosen and were recruited were there for many many years and I'd like to ask you what instigated this decision to do this and what good would it do to have so many infiltrators in different countries to report and to work for the Mossad? Well in fact uh, it was in 1959. Mm. There is an author who talks a, a lot about this, Gordon Thomas, who is known as a great author of a specialist of the secret services in England and in Israel, in yeah. the Mossad. And he interviewed all the presidents or the chiefs of the Mossad since 1959 with Amir Amit, who told him, who, who said that in 1959 he thought about all the tens of thousands of Jews all over the world who could bring a useful collaboration to the Mossad. How they can be recruited? It is very easy because there is a, free, uh, a Jewish international Freemasonry called the Bnei Brit. The Bnei Brit, you have to be a Jew to get in. And this Freemasonry, uh, there are half a million of Jews in this Freemasonry. And they are of high level socially, economically, and so on. 
So it is very easy for the Mossad if they need, for instance, the Sayanim, which in Hebrew calls the helpers, people mm -hmm. who help, mm -hmm. to get maybe, for instance, they, they, they have Sayanim agents in all the fields of a country, mm -hmm. economic field, movie, medias, TV, uh, advertising, in every field they have 10, if you want, 20, 100 Sayanim inside to push this field to, uh, to collaborate with the Mossad and to help the Mossad for, to get information, to push in a way uh, the, the propaganda, to prevent propaganda against Israel, for instance, in the media and so on. And they, they go to see these people in, in, uh, in this Freemasonry, mm -hmm. and it is an honor for these Jews to come to help uh, the Mossad. So the Mossad can recruit half a million if he wants. But uh, the estimated number of the Sayanim is between 40,000 to 50,000. And it's enough to cover in all the countries, uh, to cover all the fields. Let's take an example. In New York, if you have 5,000 Sayanim in the financial uh, field, you can almost control everything. In Los Angeles, if you have 5,000 Sayanim in the movie industry, uh, TV industry, you can control almost everything. So, it's the, the, and the Sayanim is, is, they are no, not secret exactly. Nobody knows ab about them. Nobody talks about them. And I was surprised. I was the first in France mm -hmm. to put the world into, into life. I mean, into fact, as a fact. Mm -hmm. And because I, f I think that even the journalists who, who have met this world and the work, they didn't probably, they didn't um, dare to talk about because when you talk about Sayanim, you know what the system would, would uh, answer, because I, I, get, uh, I get this, this answer. Oh, you, you talk about the conspiracy of the Jew, mm -hmm. of the Jewish, it is anti-Semitic and so on. But I tell them, look, it is a reality, the Sayanim. And there is also an author called Viktor Ostrovsky, who were an, a, a real agent of the Mossad, an Israeli real agent, not a Sayan, and who got through all the formation and all this. And when he quit in the 80s, he wrote a book and he talked a lot about the Sayanim. So it's a reality. I mean, a, so the, um, you take credit, uh, rightly so, to expose it in France, yes. to highlight it, Sayanim, yes, yes. meaning the helpers. Yes. And um, you discovered that they, they were the real aiders yes. of uh, the agendas that yes. the Mossad had. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was not one or two or 100 or 200, there were many. Yes. It, was a, it was a big policy. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, has there been any documentary ever made about the Sayanim? To my knowledge, no. Mm -hmm. But uh, maybe, I, 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 I'm not sure. Uh, as far as I know, in, in France, the, even the word was never said. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, it was like uh, when I wrote a book, The Spring of the Sayanim, it was like a small bomb or something like that. But wow. uh, maybe in, in, in the Anglo-Saxon, uh, they are more, a little bit more free to, to talk about, but I'm not sure. But I, I know that this uh, Gordon Thomas mm -hmm. uh, has a lot of information about Sayanim. And no one can uh, contest his affirmations because he interviewed all the chiefs of the Mossad since Meir Amid in 1959. And no one, I say no one, uh, made a process against him. I mean, uh, contested his, his affirmations about Zionism. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting that when you mentioned the yes. 1959, this is the era in which Hollywood made a lot of... Uh, very pro-Israel movies, exactly. the Ten Commandments, Exodus. 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 Exodus was a very, very important. I, I think, Exo, you know, when, when uh, the, the, the movie team came to Israel, 
it was received by the prime minister. Team? The team of the movie. I yes, mean, yes. Oh, the cast, the cast the and cast, crew. Yeah, the cast, you know, Paul Newman and, and the director, oh, yeah. I don't remember the name of the director. When they came to the airport, they were received by the prime minister, mm -hmm. Ben Gurion himself. Mm -hmm. I mean, just to show the importance of this movie. And I think retrospectively, I think this movie formed a, ge a whole generation, one generation, mm -hmm. of people in the Western world mm -hmm. to, be, to, to see Israel in a very, very good way. Mm -hmm. Because it, you have all the, the story of 1948 yes. uh, written uh, to say that, you know, the Jews come just to live quietly and peacefully and, you know, unhappily the Arabs with the Palestinians didn't want and they fought and they, they, they went away even that the Jews told them, no, 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 stay with us, we want to live together. I mean, you see the movie and it, it was a big success all over the world. Mm. And a generation of Westerners were conquered by this ideology. Yes. Just one movie, yes, just yes. to see how one movie can make a propaganda, fa fantastic propaganda. Yeah. I'll tell you a little memory from my own childhood when the Ten Commandments yes. uh, was made and it was uh, came to Iran. Yes. And because the Shah had a very pro-Israel yes. uh, policy, and it was meant to be that way and dictated to him by also by the, by the U.S. The Shah went personally with his family to watch the movie, The Ten Commandments, mm -hmm. and he had never done that for any movie. He went and then it became vogue for all the Iranians to go to, to watch The Ten Commandments, which was shown in one special theater. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when people started realizing this was like very, very propagandish, he had to go see another film, uh, an Iranian film, to make up for that uh, rumor that mm. uh, it's, it's too pro-Israel. So <clears throat> there was this, this is the era where Hollywood does come to full aid. Then there was Samson and Delilah mm. from, the book yes, of, yes. Uh, from the book of Judges, I believe, uh, in the Bible. Um, going back uh, to um, you, when, when did this, um, this pursuit that you have, mm -hmm. like a mission to yes. expose to illuminate, mm -hmm. and you're illuminating the, the French-speaking mm -hmm. audience. Uh, when did this, when was the first spark that you, someone has to speak out and not to retreat and to expose mm -hmm. this? Well, it began in Morocco, in fact, because I was, uh, I was in a Zionist youth movement. You yourself were in a Zionist youth movement? Yes. So I know the, you know, I know how they, they work, but at that time, naturally, I was 16, 17, 18. Right. I was totally uh, in, inside and with them and so on. And then I realized how they took these ignorant Jewish Jews, Moroccan Jews, to Israel. They, they told them uh, like propaganda. And when they, they arrived, they were treated like Arabs, which it is, which is uh, I mean, uh, very... Uh, humiliating them, they, they, they took them to the desert, uh, the desertic areas. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, when I realized all this, I mean, it was a shock, you know, like, uh, like, like they, they were treated like indigen, in, you know, yes, like, yes. like people of, of nothing. And you know, the first, the, the Moroccans, there were riots in 1958, 59 with dead, dead people. I mean, the police shot the, the Moroccans, Jews, because they were protesting of their conditions. In Israel? In Israel, yes. uh, like Wadi Salim, you know, the rise of Wadi yes. Salim. And even after that, the Moroccan Jews created the Black Panther movement to contest mm -hmm. the domination mm -hmm. of uh, the Zionist Askenaz, you know, people coming from Europe, mm -hmm. who treated people coming from Arabic countries like uh, Okay, I don't, uh, I don't find the word, but uh, yeah. So this is, uh, and as my family, all my family went to Israel because the people from Morocco who went to Israel were the poorest people who had no education, French education, who have no profession, who have no capital. 
And they went to Israel because they, they, have, they had no uh, place to go because after the 60s, half of the Jews of Morocco went to Canada, to France, to Spain. And all my family went to Israel. And when I, I went the first time in 69 to visit them, I realized what the country was about. I mean, the racism, the humiliation and everything. And that was the first shock mm -hmm. that struck, struck me. Mm -hmm. And after that, I, deco I discovered what the Nakba, and, uh, what the Zionism was about. Mm -hmm. uh, and the danger, I think, personally, even, e even if I'm not religious, uh, I think that the Zionism is a very big danger for the Jewish people. Because the Jewish people, uh, as it was all more or less forced to embark into Zionism, mm. uh, it, I think it will pay, uh, it, it, the Jewish people has lost its nature, its, its uh, raison d'être. Mm. I mean, what, what, what it's uh, the purpose of his existing here, here. Right. you know, education, right. uh, religion, humani humanity, and so yeah. on. And the Zionism has turned this in, in, in another way. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Jews has become more arrogant, uh, more, more uh, next to the power, power people, you know. Mm -hmm. In France, in the States, for instance, they were uh, uh, near Bush and, you know. They, they were no more these intellectuals who try to, to give light to educate, to uh, search for justice. Mm -hmm. No, they, they turned out, they, they, they turned to be near the conquerors. Mm -hmm. uh, so this, this was my, my turning point, if, you, if I may say. Uh, yes, yes. Um, Dr. Cohn, um, yes. you, at one point, you merge into writing novels. Yes. Uh, in, in the form of fiction, but yes. based on still the documentary and the reality. Yes. Explain that strategy. Okay. Well, first of all, I like literature. Okay. But second and most important, fiction gives me a big, a great freedom. Mm -hmm. For instance, I don't have, no, uh, if I talk about Sayanim, well, I know I'm sure of some people in France who are Sayanim, but I'm not sure. I mean, nobody, the, no, is not written that they are saying him. But uh, I follow them in their action, for instance, in, in the Freemasonry, in the media, in, in, every, uh, in every field, mm -hmm. in each field. And I, uh, I can say when they make an action, for instance, mm -hmm. like a meeting, football meeting between young Israelis and young Palestinians. Mm -hmm. So I understand uh, wh why they do that mm -hmm. and, and so on. So uh, I don't have the material, the real material, to uh, to write precisely about these this, uh, this actions and this, this man. So fiction gives me uh, a, a, a great freedom, and I want to to give the lecture the reader mm -hmm. the feeling of of uh, a person why. Mm -hmm how he, he got into, into this, why, mm -hmm. uh, how, the, how does he feel, mm -hmm. what his per perspective. Right. So if I write an essay, it will be dry. I don't know, in French we it say dry, I mean, it's right. not. But in a fiction, I can, I can put a lot, I can, I can give an amb ambience, ambience. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, so th that's why, I prefer writing uh, fictions. I, I want to give the reader the feeling of, of uh, something li live, mm -hmm. some, you know. And uh, for instance, I wrote, uh, all my novels are based on, uh, are sociological, political. Mm -hmm. uh, when I wrote my first novel, it was about how a certain bourgeoisie, um, Muslim bourgeoisie in Morocco pushed out uh, Jew, Jew, uh, Jewish businessmen out of business. Okay, I mean, you can write an article about that, but because I don't know also 
all all the in reality how how it it, it has been done because I don't have the documents. Right. So, you know, I I realize and I give I want to give this answer to a lot of Moroccans. How could it have been possible mm -hmm. that this businessman pushed out Jew, Jew, uh, Jewish businessman? And what was the feeling, the real feeling, mm -hmm. of of the Jews in in this in, in this context? Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that's why I I write uh, I write fictions. Um, do you usually authors do get uh, exposure in television and media? Yes. Does that happen with you in no, France? Never. I mean, uh, uh, not only I didn't get an exposure, but uh, a lot of people said, beware of what Cohen says. Beware. <laughs> he is anti-Semitic, he is complotist, he, he, uh, he brings back all the old conspiracy about, about the Jews and everything. Yes. And even not only, not only from Jew, Jewish part, but also from communist party, for instance. The, the communist paper, L'Humanité, I met with a journalist, it was, uh, I, I don't, by chance I met her, yeah. before the spring of the signing. And I showed her the, how do you say, the, the, the resume, you know? Yeah. And she told me, oh, it's, it looks very interesting. And uh, I sent her uh, an, well, a book and she never wanted to talk about it. Because we are afraid, in France, a lot of orga organizations, even Palestinians are terrorized that they could be accused of anti-Semitism if they invite Jacob Cohen to speak about Zionism. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest, probably the biggest organization called Association France-Palestine Solidarité uh, gave order to boycott my book and my person. Uh, it's a, r a real terrorism, intellectual terrorism, because they are afraid to be accused, maybe, uh, of anti-Semitism, anti and that's why I don't get, I don't, I didn't get exposure naturally uh, with the big medias. It, it, it was obvious, but also by a lot of organizations, leftist, leftist organization. Palestinian organization, because I I don't respect certain you know certain things you know, mm -hmm. so I, I go I go too far, and I you know I talk about things which are uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, so I uh, maybe I was uh, I don't know, it was your question. I think. Yeah, my 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 other question was that. France was guilty yes. during World War II yes. for uh, giving the names and details yes. of all the Jewish people living yes. in France, and they gave it to the Germans. Yes. And they were, all, they, they were collected one by one yes. and, and sent to, uh, with these trains to the concentration mm -hmm. camps, Dachau, Auschwitz. Actually, they, 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 they participated in the mass killings of a lot of Jewish people. Um, and 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 the, it's, the, it's the French that they, of course they apologized yes. to the to the government of Palestine, Israel. Uh, do you, did you do you have any feelings about that? And that France itself has been done doing that. Well, the, the, naturally, uh, because uh, the government uh, which who signed the the truce with Germany, Maréchal Pétain, naturally collaborated with the Germans. Uh, to uh, to per to chase the Jews, and there were a lot of collaborators. But after that, you know, in France, it was not so easy to apologize. De Gaulle never wanted to apologize. Pompidou never wanted. Mitterrand never wanted. He said, "I don't want to to go back to this policy. I, I am against the hate. It's history." It's finished until Jacques Chirac in 1995, who really gave a, a new policy, which is to apologize officially that the state is responsible. But 
in, in recognizing this, this responsibility, he offers the Jewish lobby a lot of compensations. Naturally, uh, a big place in, in the country uh, to chase any sign of anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and naturally, any criticism of Israel be be becomes anti-Semitic. So, it was this policy mm -hmm. was also, for instance, a few months ago, the, the railway uh, Holland of Holland. Mm -hmm. Apologize also for transporting. Uh, they were obliged, but they apologized and gave a lot of millions of dollars compensation. Mm -hmm. uh, and this uh, policy of apologizing created a, a, a feeling of cul culpabilization. Yes. Okay? Yes. Which al always the Jewish lobby uh, takes out, you know. Look what we have done to us 70 years ago, 80 years ago. Now, you know, uh, let's uh, let's uh, be uh, no, not to criticizing Israel and everything. So it, it has uh, the, the Jewish lobby uses this sense of culpability uh, to uh, to give Israel a, a kind of. Uh, uh, why I don't know a blank. I, I mean, carte blanche. Yeah, carte blanche. Yeah. To do it. Yeah. Uh, this uh, apologizing, which continues right now, you know, yes. because uh, anti-Semitism anti has become the new, uh, uh, the new instrument, propaganda instrument of the lobby mm -hmm. uh, to prevent any criticize of Israel, you know, mm -hmm. because. Nowadays, in the definition of anti-Semitism, mm. uh, which do you know also makes, uh, did, did it, it recovers this definition, mm -hmm. it recognizes that any criticism or, or harsh criticism of Israel mm. or an appeal to boycott is considered as anti-Semitism. And as anti-Semitism is condemned by law, so any criticism could be condemned by law. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and how does the Israeli press cover you? How do they, how do they look at you? Israeli press? Press, yeah. Well, uh, well you, I, I don't read uh, Israeli press because uh, I don't know Hebrew enough. But uh, it was... Once I went, uh, I went very often to Israel to see the family, and I could read the press. You know, I could understand fifty percent, and uh, it, it looks to me that it, it is uh, a free press, which can talk a lot of subjects, sensitive subject, uh, more than in France, I think. More than uh, France. Yes. Yes. And I was sometimes surprised, uh, for instance, uh, once I found an article about the racism against Arab, Israeli Arab, uh, plain, plain fully like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, naturally, this, it is uh, the, uh, the whole press, 90% of this press are Zionist. I mean, it can criticize, but when it comes to the state, Zionism, and, and you know, it, it's behind the government. Yeah. This press, for instance, because they have censorship in Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's funny, I mean, it's a free press, but uh, they have a, a bureau of censorship. And when the bureau of censorship says uh, this information is censored, all the medias obey. Um, and it's very, uh, it's ambiguous. For instance, you know, I remember a story of, uh, you know, a young, uh, young girl, which uh, when she was drafted to, to the military service, she got, uh, she, she got a function within, with, next to the chief of staff. And she saw documents 
that against the, the advice of the Supreme Court, the army killed people without, uh, you know, we, we say in French, des assassinats extrajudiciaires. Mm -hmm. I mean, extrajudiciary Extra killings. Yes. Yes. She had the documents and she gave them to a journalist of Haaretz. And this journalist went abroad to the United Kingdom. But finally, he, he came back and the, the girl was convicted to five years in imprisonment. Because the security in Israel is like holy, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can, you can criticize, you can say things here and there. But when it comes to the security, mm -hmm. it's holy. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cohen. Thank you so much. Great pleasure. Thank you for your attention. We bid you farewell till our next program.